Um, yeah. Do you want that out in a canvas announcement too? Just yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. So uh, let's talk. So I'll talk real quick about error analysis. There's not a whole lot that I'll go through. There's a, a set of notes that I found online from the University of North Carolina Physics and Astronomy Department that I thought were useful for looking at error analysis. It kind of goes through goes through things really thoroughly. For the lab that you're doing this week, uh, I realized you're, you actually only took one data point for each load, which it would have been nice in retrospect to have you take multiple ones so you could have some statistical analysis. But this will be at least useful for the attention lab the, fall, the week after next week. Um, so a couple things to think about when you're doing error analysis. So you have to be thinking about sources of error, where your error is coming from, if it's Generally, for this lab, it'll either be machine error or measurement error. So measurement error, for example, if I have uh, a measuring device and I want to measure the distance between two points, the most accurate that I can measure it is one half. Uh, accuracy is uh, one half the smallest unit of measurement. Measurement. So here, if I say this is this ruler is in millimeters, I can measure plus or minus half a millimeter, because I can say these lines are apart by uh, that's actually pretty close to five. But so then say this is five millimeters plus or minus half a millimeter, because that's I, I can't actually resolve uh, below that. I know it's closer to one than the other. I still can't quite get it. Similarly for digital readouts. If, if my digital readout ends at a certain decimal point, you know plus or minus half of half the certainty of that decimal point. Uh, there's a couple useful statistical quantities when you're calculating error for measurements. So the we have first the, the average of a number of measurements. So if I have some data set X uh, is some set of measurements X1, X2 through xn, uh, I can say the average of that number of measurements is the sum of xi over n, or the 1 uh, plus x2 plus, plus xn all over n. This is probably something you're very familiar with, uh, maybe from elementary school, but I'm going to reiterate it here anyway just so we can have it all written out formally. So once, so if you had a data set where you had, so for the tension lab next week, the week after, you'll have three measurements for uh, all of your all of your quantities, Young's modulus, yield strength, uh, ultimate tensile strength, and you'll be able to find an average of those three. When you report it, you report the average and the standard deviation of that data. So standard deviation, uh, I'm going to call, uh, I don't want to call it a sigma. <laughs> what do I want to call standard deviation? SD. SD, sure. Let's call it standard deviation. Um, this is going to be the square root of the sum of the difference between the measurements. So my standard deviation, I want to figure out if I have some set of data points in here. I want to figure out what the average is, and I want to figure out the average distance between my average and all of those data points. So the way that I do that is I take the square root of the sum of my xi minus the average um, squared all over n minus 1. So then when I'm reporting data later on, so say I, I have a Young's modulus and I'm measuring a Young's modulus of aluminum and I say I have, I measure, let's make this easy on me, 68 uh, 69 and 70 GPA for my Young's modulus. So then I would have my average is 69 gigapascals. Um, and then I would be saying plus or minus the standard deviation of that data, which, oh, 1 squared 2 over 2. Is that just 1, right? I, I think I'm doing math right. I'm doing this right in front of you and I'm probably making a mistake so I apologize but this is now when you're reporting this this is the the average of the data set 
and this is the standard deviation of your data set. When you have that error now, uh, we want to look at how that error propagates. So say you did, this is probably the most relevant for this lab. So you made, you made a whole bunch of displacement measurements, you made a whole bunch of uh, load measurements, and you want to calculate theoretical values for, for strain and stress, uh, stress and strain, and relate that to your measurements. So when you're propagating that error, now that we have a standard devi or an average and a standard deviation, um, there's a couple ways to go about it. The simplest way to go about it is to just find upper and lower bounds for your error. So say I have, um, I want to look at what the, the length of something is. Let's say, uh, let's say the moment on something is the force times the distance. So let's say I know my force, I'm not going to do this for multiple, or I'll, I'll do this for a single value now. Um, let's say I know my force is 10 newtons, and I know my distance is, um, I don't know, 5 millimeters plus or minus half a millimeter. Now my moment, I can just linearly calculate the upper and lower bound from that moment. So my moment is going to be that 10 newtons, so this is 50 newton millimeters plus or minus 5 newton millimeters. So this would be kind of a straightforward upper and lower bound, just calculating linearly from, my, from the error. There's a more formal way to do this, actually, if you have Say this was say we also had an unknown quantity here in our force data, and that's a propagation of uncertainty. So I can say now, if I have some function f that's a function of x and y, uh, and I know the deviation of f, or I, and I want to figure out the standard deviation of f, and I know the standard deviation of x and y, I can say that standard deviation of F, let's make this a little one, is the derivative of F with respect to X times the standard deviation of X, oh, I don't <laughs> think that's a squared, plus F dy, ah, oh, damn it, standard deviation of X plus the standard deviation of Y, uh, I think this is then, there's a square root and a square in there want to make sure I don't give it to you incorrectly. So let me make sure I have it right. Yes. Okay. All of this squared, 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 squared. There we go. So now, if I wanted to figure out, if, if now I knew what the standard deviation of my force measurement was and my displacement measurement, and I wanted to figure out <coughs> the new standard deviation, I would have, I could say the, the derivative of my moment with respect to um, my force is my displacement. So I would have uh, the standard deviation, so, so d, m, d, d oh, is f, d, m, d, f is d. So if I wanted to find now the standard deviation of the moment, I could say this was the square root of my f squared uh, standard, blah, standard deviation of my displacement squared plus my displacement squared times the standard deviation of my force squared. So that carries over, it's not, you don't necessarily sum the errors, so uh, if I knew this was 5% and or uh, say this was 10% error, this also happened to be 10% error, I wouldn't have 10% error, I wouldn't have 20% error, I would have something in between those two. Um, and I can find that something in between those two based on this standard deviation formulation. So uh, I'll send you a sheet of notes on this, and I'll post it onto Canvas that goes through this in a little bit more detail, but I at least wanted to talk about it really briefly and, and relate it to what you'll be seeing for your lab. Uh, cool. Questions on things? Which of either versions of these are we expected to use 
views on our lives. <laughs> Which I, I would assume at bare minimum you should be propagating error. So bare minimum you should say what upper and lower bounds of error are. If you want to be thorough, um, this is a more technically correct way to propagate error. Um, I don't know that we'll necessarily dock points for not using this method, um, but at least giving some justification for why you're carrying the error through the way you are um, is important. Yeah, so, so bare minimum you should be propagating error from the measurements through each step and taking account of that. So that'll be part of um, comparing your, your theoretical and your experimental results is saying, okay, I know, I know the values and I know whether the, the error bounds overlap with each other. So generally, if you're reporting some sort of data with error bounds, this is particularly relevant for biology, but I'm gonna plot it out here. If I say have a few measurements here, and I know this is some, some value, some average of something, and these are just different tests that I ran, and I know what the error standard deviation on these are. I could say that because these two tests have an overlap, have data that uh, have averages that are different, but standard deviations that overlap, they're not statistically significantly different. So they're effectively, they're different, but they're not different enough to say that they're um, usefully different. Whereas these two, there's actually a difference here between their average and their standard deviation bounds. So then here, this is now a statistically significant result saying that, oh look, these are different and it's different by such, such an amount that their error doesn't even, their standard deviation doesn't even overlap. So this is now, this means that these are statistically different results. Um, and so that's kind of what you'll be looking at maybe not necessarily plotting it out in this form, but that's the idea for what you're looking at with this lab. So if your error bounds overlap, you say, well, they're different, but it's within the error, so maybe it was just a measurement error, and that's what you're gonna be justifying in the lab. But if it's very different, then you have to come up with a little bit more reasoned out explanation. Okay, why are they significantly different? Why, where is this difference coming from? Is my experiment wrong? Is my theory wrong? Which which is causing this sort of disagreement. I had a question on the lab report about uh, reporting equations. Um, I know that it talks, it talks a bit about formatting in terms of like putting in, when you're putting like graphs and other things, you don't want them to be hanging. Uh -huh. um, do you want us to be able to be putting mm -hmm. the equations like in the text or like um, branched out as like its own like image that we might be able to like insert into it. Does, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Simple equations you can embed in the text. If it's something like the area is the base times the width, you don't need a, a line equation for that. But if it's something that is a distinguishable equation, like an, an equation that's important and unique, important for the lab and unique to the lab, you can have that as a separate line. Okay. Um, so if you take a look in the lecture notes, I kind of do that a bit where I have some simple equations I'll just have embedded in the paragraphs, and then important equations I have line itemed and have an equation number with them, okay. so that you so that you can then reference them later on. Makes sense. Is a calculation table an acceptable way of showing what equations we used and how we got to what answers? What do you mean a calculation table? Like a table where you put uh, like calculated quantities in variable <coughs> form across the top, and then in each row you put the actual calculated values for each data point. Hmm. So kind of like what you would see from an Excel sheet? Yeah, very much so. So you would need to at least say what the equations were that you were using to calculate things <laughs> yes. out, but that's fine for presenting data. Okay. And I think in there, I, I, in the template that we gave out, I had add a table of stress values, add a table of strain values. Mm -hmm. So that, that sort of a way of presenting data is totally fine. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions about error analysis? Otherwise, Praveen can give you all a recitation for the lab and tell you how to actually do the analysis. Probably useful for especially those of you who haven't started. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, take it away.
Do you want a yeah, papers and anything thing to write on? No, okay. I've got something. Okay. Just oh, yeah. This is also erasable. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sweet. I know. It's super cool. Yeah, right. Let's see how this works. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so me have this. Okay. So just a quick refresh about the lab. Uh, what we basically did was uh, we just uh, did bending test on two uh, aluminium beams with rectangular cross section, and then we did a three point and a four point test, and then we recorded the strain at four different locations on the beam. I mean, we used a strain rosette which had like three different axes. And then we uh, also measured the deflection at the center point, right? So that's all what we did. And in the analysis, what we're basically gonna do is just theoretically calculate those deflection and strain values and then compare them with the experimental results. What you've got. <coughs> that's the whole idea here. Let me just quickly go over a few things, the equations and then that's actually look in detail about this part. I'll go over each of this what's actually asked in your manual and then and then that should be good enough. Okay. Okay, cool. So let me see. So let's for example uh, take the three point bending case. Basically, the schematic what we have is something like <coughs> over two, and then P over two, this is P over two, and then your strain rosettes were like one, two, three, four. Right? Yeah. Okay. And then the <laughs> <laughs> coordinate system what we had was something like this. Okay. So now if we look at the the distribution of the shear force, it's gonna be P over two and then minus P over two for like, you know sorry. By two over L, and the moment are going to be something like P X by two, and then P into L minus X by two. Again, for the same bonds. Right. So you guys know all this, right? <coughs> Hopefully. Okay. Sounds good. Then. The equation for the maximum deflection and you know how to derive this. So all this is already given in the manual. So and you can look over that and also it's in the in the, in the notes with professor provided. So you can just look over that basically and this is uh, and it's going to be the same for the there's a similar way to calculate for the four point bending case as well. Okay. And then now if we get into the the strains, right? So for that we first need to know what are the stress acting on the beam. So what are the two types of stresses on the beam in this uh, bending test. Stress and axial. Sorry? Strain, uh, uh, shear and axial. Okay, so shear, axial. So now say if I take a cross section of this beam, right? Okay. 
Now, how is the axial stress distributed <coughs> across the stream? The reason why you know this is, you have to know this is like your strain resets are placed at different positions on the beam. So, you need to know what stresses are actually acting at that positions and what the strain gauges are measuring, right? So, now how is the axial stress distributed across the cross section? Compressive at the top. Right? And the axial stress is going to be where if you take, for example, this guy, it's going to be minus h over 2, and this guy is going to be h over 2. Right? What about the shear stress? Yeah, a quadratic function, so it's going to be zero here on the surface, and down here it's going to be max and the equations right so now if you remember let's see how the strain gauge So we had a strain reset one here, three, and then there was one somewhere here, just like say four. And you had right. So for strain gauge one what's going to be the stress that's acting on that surface? Yeah. Axial, compression. Axial compression. Okay, what about this guy, three? Axial tension. Axial tension. And then your two, only the shear. And then for four, it's again the same, like it's on the top surface. So it's just going to be only axial. So now you know what are all the stresses that are going to act are acting and what the strain gauge is measuring. That's the most important thing that you have to know before you start analyzing is because once you know this, then all you need is you've got the equations for the strain here. Sorry, the stress here. You just need to convert that to strains because it's a uniaxial loading, your strain on, say the x is going to be the axial stress by the Young's modulus and on y it's going to be and similarly on the z it's going to be right so these are basically the strains in the x, y and z direction and all you've got is only the stress sigma x which is the axial stress. And then for the shear strain, uh, sorry this is shear strain, I just want to make sure I don't confuse you with the symbols. <laughs> so it's going to be the shear stress divided by g. And what's G? Shear modulus. Shear modulus. How do you calculate that? <coughs> and this is valid only for Which is a fair assumption to take. So, 
uh, you know the Young's modulus, you know the Poisson's ratio, then you can calculate the, uh, the, the shear modulus. So now you basically have got equations to calculate the shear on x, y, z and also the, sorry, the, the strain on x, y, z and also the shear strain. This is all, yeah. What are the like, two subscripts um, under the sigma for, for strain x and y? Oh, so it's basically the stress along oh, x, oh, x, yeah, because you only have, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, not good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Is this clear? Okay, let's just do one example. Let's just take the, 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 the three point bending case and let's just see a mock calculation for say a strain gauge one. Okay. So The strain gauge one was right down here at the point of loading, right? Now let's just look at the top view because each of the strain rosette had like three different orientations if you remember, right? So. So we had something like this, right? Right? And then this was 45. Now all the <coughs> all the equations are what what's in the manual are basically for symmetric loading. So even though when you you did like physical dimensions measurements if you found out that you know the loading was not perfectly symmetric you can just point it out as a source of <coughs> when you do the error analysis but for the equations you just assume it's symmetric loading and then this yeah for all the rosettes did like the a direction point along the x axis no 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 so yeah you you got to look at the the, the schematic yeah yeah Right. So now, now basically, yeah. Is your Y coming out of the page or going in? So this is the top view. So, yeah, it's going to be like this, right? So, so on a three D, my my things were like say if this is how it was looking. Okay, I'm not really good at this, but. <laughs> And then your Z is something like this, Z, Y, X, right? Okay. So now the whole idea here is you're going to calculate, theoretically calculate what these values are, right? 1A, 1B, 1C. And if you remember, these are the values that you re recorded in the experiment, right? And you're just basically going to go compare these values. That's all. So for for calculating this, you're going to use these equations, right? For which you need to calculate this guy. So in order to calculate your Right? Now say this is at position 1, right? I'm going to call this because it's strain to set 1. So what's the moment at this point? Like assume this is at the, the, the center of the beam. Yeah, Px over 2, right? So your x here is L over 2. So, so this gives you the moment, right? 
once you know the moment you can calculate time. once you know that guy and you just calculate the strain yeah then the strain along y is going to be and we are on the xy plane right your strain reset 1 is on the xy plane so it's not going to measure anything on the z but what about shear stress zero so now so What was sigma x? And then your sigma y would be right. So you've got one a, one c. So all you need is this guy. Wouldn't it be negative one c because it's only other direction? Because y is coming out of the page and 1c is pointing into the page? In terms of the strain, where's that? Was it 1c pointing in the opposite direction to the y axis? Oh, yeah. No, yeah. yeah, you're right. You're right. It's tension and compression. Yeah. So that will automatically get adjusted because I'm basically what you're doing is when you're compressing, <laughs> the stuff is going to, I mean, the beam is yeah. going to. And yeah. when you're pulling it, the beam yeah, is going to Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, how do you calculate 1B? Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, using the strain transformation equations. So, I think it's also given in the in the notes. Well, just quickly write the equations just in case so basically what you do is now imagine if you have a axis like this okay got it now you're just gonna rotate it by an angle theta so basically what you are doing here is I know sigma x sigma y all I need to find is this guy that's what you're doing so use this to actually find this and uh, yeah I can write down those equations real quick but they are given in the in the notes so you can go check that kind of similarly you've got equations for sigma y dash and then sigma x bar y bar We don't need the. We don't need the sigma y prime and sigma x prime y in this case. Yeah, in this case you don't need that. But if you if you remember there was uh, the, the strain reset four. 
So your strain reset 4 was something like this where 4b at you know 4a and 4c right so for that what i would do is and then basically i'm just going to rotate this right so in that case you might need that equation but for uh, all the other strain resets this you just could only with this guy this is more than enough because we only have like one uh, reset which is like 45 degrees should we include um, more strain equations more strain circle or uh, stress uh, circle in our reports um, or should we just include the values the this oh you circles. mean the, mo the more yeah. so yeah, I mean you can include that in the appendix and also like probably you can show me if you use that to calculate your strains then just show me for one cal <coughs> mock calculation or something like that and that's Thank you. yeah so in our case like say for example this would be 1a and you can take this as 1b and this is like 1c right So you, if you know 1A and 1C, you can calculate your 1B, that's all. And then you do that and you compare it with the, uh, uh, with the experimental values what you got and do the same error analysis with you, you know, what, what professor taught and then that's it. So this is for strain gauge 1, I w also want to point out specifically for strain gauge 2. Like say for example, mm, so if you remember, okay, yeah, so you're right down there. This was strain gauge two, right? Was was right on the neutral axis. And again, I'm just pointing out for theoretical calculations, assume it was <coughs> spot on the neutral axis and it was, say, when you measured it was off by like a millimeter or something, <coughs> point it out in the results. Don't try to you know, do equations for the strain gauge not on the neutral axis, it's going to get a little more complex. So it's just okay. Just play it simple. <laughs> so, so it is kind of oriented, the resets were something like this, right? So this is X, and this was your Z. Now for strain gauge 2, again the same principle, but uh, what's your Sigma x, sigma z going to be, or your strain along the x and strain along z are going to be. So basically, what's your strain along the x? It's sigma x by e, right? So what's your? This is zero. So your sigma z is minus. This is zero. So these two are. Right. What about your shear stress? I mean, sorry, shear strain. Okay, maximum shear stress divided by G, right? So you've got equations for these two. So I think I just give you that. So it's going to be three Q by two B H to G. So this is basically your the max equation. So you can calculate the shear strain, right? 
Can I ask what Q is? Oh, okay. Maybe I should have told that. So, Q is basically the, I think the load according to our assumption, it's actually the, the shear force, which basically is going to be this guy. Q. It's going to be P over 2. Uh, yeah. <coughs> okay. So, for strain gauge 3 and 4, it's going to be the same. The strain gauge 4 is on the same surface as strain gauge 1, and then 3 is on the bottom surface. But it's just principally the, the same idea. Yeah. So the, in this case, the epsilon xz shear, shear strain corresponds with 2b? No, not just 2b. That's everything, right, what you're measuring. So your, if you look at these equations, right? Even sigma x actually has a shear component. Okay. Well, good. Okay. So, I think let me quickly go over this part. What's actually asked? Okay. First thing, you obtain experimental s values for the strain, which is what you did in the lab. That's this guy just done. The second thing is determining theoretical values for the strain and deflection at various applied loads. I, that's what we did a couple of minutes before. So I've given you the equations for uh, the three bending case, the, 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 the midpoint deflection and also the strain. It's just the same for the four point. You've also got the equations on the manual to do that. Then you're going to compare the experimental values with your theoretical values. Simple. And then you determine the relationship between deflection, the theoretical deflection and the experimentation. So basically what we want is something like a, a, a graph where like load versus uh, uh, or like say, let's say deflection versus load, something like like you know, uh, or or you know, we probably have like two straight lines. One would be theoretical, other would be experimental. Something like this, just to compare how it looks, theoretical and experimental. Okay, so that part is done. Now in the discussion. The error analysis, uh, you just compare the values and then you also specifically point out things like this. And also more important things like you, uh, you, you got to give proper bounds for the error like what we discussed in the lecture, the first half of the lecture. So that is an important thing. And then, uh, yeah. What's the difference between the three point and the four point bending case? And like, what did you see? Like, I don't like something uh, concrete. Like, I don't want to. I don't want you to say, okay, for three point there are like three point loads, for four point there are like four point <laughs> loads. <laughs> something beyond that, like you know, what's the volume of the material under stress? How the moment is distributed and things like that. Okay. And. Uh, the effect of strained reset position. So basically in this specifically what I'm looking for is I want you to compare strain reset 1 and 4 for the 3 point and the 4 point cases. How do they look? How do they compare? 1 and 4 on the same surface of the beam but they are at different positions, right? So I want you guys to compare how those values look for 
the three point and the four point bending case. And the last one is just basically uh, an overall like compare the other strain rosettes as well. So point three specifically for the top surface and the point four is just like compare one and two and one and three how do they look? Well, you know how does strain rosette two look? Like how the values look and stuff like that. All good. Yeah, once you just do all this and then finally just follow the template because the template basically is just an organization. If you answer all this and then just put it in that format, then you guys are good. Um, for future labs, what can we expect to be different from this? Are we going to have a lab template with the same sort of fashion? Nothing we'll, different. We'll give you one for the tension lab because it'll be a formal report. And then after that, it'll be. Okay. okay, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.